Welcome. It's just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 8th of September, and you are watching episode 22 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, providing an insight to the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Will Bates. Joining me on this episode, asked state border wars threatening the Federation, is my guest Morgan Begg. Morgan has been a research fellow at the Institute of Public Affairs since 2014, where he specialises in legal rights, freedoms of speech and religion, rule of law and constitutional issues. He has authored research papers on the GST and federalism, red tape and centralisation, religious liberty and anti-vilification laws such as Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Morgan initially joined the IPA to advance a major report in the state of fundamental legal rights in Australia. The report was subsequently extensively referenced in the Australian Law Reform Commission's Seminal Freedoms Inquiry, released in 2016. He has since authored new, numerous IPA review essays, submissions to parliament inquiries, newspaper opinion pieces, as well as being a regular contributor to the Spectator, Spectator magazine. Welcome, Morgan. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, we'll start off in regards to a lot of the angst in regards to some politicians being upset with the federal government and not, not taking charge in this COVID situation and other people getting angst with the state premiers for locking, locking down their population at a moment's notice for just a few cases. Now, do you think the way it's, it's shaping up is turning into a bit of a battle between the states and the, and the federal government in regards to, we've seen a lot of people comment in regards to now, state, state should be abolished. Let, let the federals run the whole thing. <laughs> Well, I definitely disagree with that suggestion, um, and I don't think um, I, I don't think the experience under COVID has proven uh, a, a failure of the states, but there has been a complete breakdown of accountability, and that's not because of federalism, but it's because we don't practice federalism properly. Um, this is this is a consequence of uh, decades of. Uh, an imbalance uh, essentially between the revenue raising capacities of the states uh, and the powers of the states uh, under the constitution. So what we've seen is uh, the Commonwealth government now collects most of the taxation revenue through mainly through income taxes, but also through uh, various other excises and fees. Uh, but the states have retained a significant amount of powers uh, and we've seen that one of those powers is protection of public health. Now, what that means is that the states are able to announce, you know, these draconian measures, these uh, completely arbitrary and disproportionate uh, responses to, uh, let's say, a pandemic, uh, but they don't wear the consequences financially. Uh, it's, you know, the Commonwealth government has essentially covered it completely with their, their, the existing welfare system, but also the new welfare programs like JobKeeper. So uh, the, the, the states aren't necessarily suffering or they're not, they're not actually paying a cost for their policies, but they get the benefits uh, of a, you know, a strong response and looking like they're doing as much as they possibly can, uh, but there's no cost. I think also the other thing that seems to be a very weak in the, in the system too is within the state governments, the ability of, of the government of the day to close their own parliament down. So their local own internal political system doesn't hold them to account. We now have a situation where the New South Wales government has been promising to reinstate the par parliament or, or recall the parliament and that's been put off and put off and, put, and that's now been put off for October. Whereas in Victoria, I don't think there is any end date when it's actually going to return. So it's almost impossible for 
uh, the opposition or cross benches or anything that to even have the discussion in Parliament now to hold their own their own state governments to account for the actions they're they're inflicting on their people. In, yeah, exactly right. There's, uh, you know, at the very least, you want in a situation like this some some democratic oversight of the extraordinary measures that are being proposed and implemented. But and, and we've seen not only Parliament cancelled, but parliaments have been cancelled by the public health bureaucrats themselves. We had that just recently in Victoria. Uh, there was a, a some figure of the COVID-19 task force um, sent a letter to the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly and the, the President of the Legislative Council advising them that they needed to uh, cancel the, the sitting days. Extraordinary, extraordinary. Parliament's, Parliament is there to impose oversight and accountability on the bureaucrat, but the bureaucrat just cancelled Parliament. A complete well, that, that, that's, an, that, that's another thing in regards to governments, especially the state governments in this, this whole pandemic, is that it's basically folded and capitulated to everything. They're responsible for the well-being of all the residents and their economy and everything else in, in all aspects. Now, but what they've done is under the guise traded out the chief health officer, put them out there and then hid behind whatever they say and say, we're, we're doing all this on the, on the best advice of the, of the health people. But a premier and a cabinet are supposed to take not only the advice of the health people, but all the other people in regards to experts on education, um, mental health, um, policing and, and business, and so the op so the economy how the economy runs uh, sure and what's happened is they're just hiding behind this oh we're, we're keeping people safe and they're not accepting accountability or responsibility for the collateral damage they caused like the thousands of businesses that have gone under the um, people being out of jobs people's futures like their planning, their financial planning has just gone down the gurgler for people in retirement. And, and now, if, if you've got children, you can see the impact on your children in regards to not going to school or being upset with, with the way things look in, with everything you know, between climate change drama and now this pandemic. They, they, they're almost terrified sort of thing. So it must be hard on parents to sort of keep their kids sort of on a level playing field, but obviously they can't do it because the calls to kids' lifeline and that have, have gone up so much. And that's, the, that's one of the things that really should worry people in general is the premiers and the cabinets are not taking account of the whole picture, They're just looking at one aspect. It's completely myopic, I agree. Um, uh, and, and just a, a complete refusal to consider that there might be other uh, considerations. There might be other factors that need to be considered. And it, it just, no, it's, no, no, don't worry about that. Uh, we're just going to go by what this one uh, public health expert says. Um, it's, it's completely irrational and disproportionate and arbitrary and and just and immoral it's actually that 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 would be the key word it's immoral what's happened one of what probably on the piece Kwai palmer uh the wa government to court in regards to um open borders and initially was supposed to be supported by the commonwealth but then they they folded hmm. um but i think it, it's likely to get legs again um but there's always seems to be a bit of a argument in what section of the constitution they should be running this, this in, because uh, I think they were taking it to the high court. So it was, a, it was I think Palmer was going for section 92 in regards to free trade. And, uh, and there's, other, there's other aspects of the constitution that might, might be uh, a viable way as well, I think. 
117 allows for uh, provides for the non-discrimination of one person in, of one state yep. coming into other and being, being discriminated. So yep. 117 provides a little bit of added, but added to that. But do you think there's uh, it's reasonable grounds in regards to using um, section 92? Because it does, because there's a couple of we, real key words there. There's probably two key words in that thing that a lot of people don't really understand in regards to or the overall use of the, those words. Is one is absolute, mm. and the other and the other one is intercourse. Mm. <laughs> a lot of people just don't get the idea of what intercourse is. You know, it, it covers a myriad of things in regards to human activity. So. Those two two words are key in, in this thing. Do you think Palmer might have a bit of legs if he gets a bit of support to go back to the High Court with uh, a combination of, say, 92 and 117? I think it's definitely, it, it's a fight, it's a challenge that you have to raise, um, especially in regards to Western Australia again. Uh, I, I hear that they're declaring that they won't allow anybody in from the rest of the country without not only a negative COVID test, but also proof of vaccination. It, it's completely absurd and disproportionate. And I think that, to my mind, even at the most generous reading of Section 92, uh, it could not, um, that proposal could not fit within Section 92. So. Um, and this is like, and this is the, the point of section 92 is like, we're a nation, we are ultimately, we're a nation of states, but we're a nation. And, and the idea of a country is that the people can move about and they can associate with other people in the country. It's quite basic. It's really simple. Uh, the, the high court, uh, it, it made it, a a habit to make it more complex than it needs to be. Um, but I think, you know, we're getting to the point where it's really quite simple. What's, well, what some of I these think... governments are doing is not compatible with the idea of a nation state. Hmm. Well, we're, we're citizens of Australia and we're not citizens of a state. So we should be able to enter any state within reason, as long as we're not going to there break the law or-, yeah. or and, you know, and the founders- or the and... or whatever. And the, the thing is, for them to m make up proposals or discriminate against one person, other, of course, they had a vaccine or not. You know, that's, that's completely irrational. We don't, if someone, we, we in this country, we do have people who are anti vaxxers and don't have vaccine. But if someone hasn't had the polio vaccine or hasn't had the whooping cough vaccine or hasn't had diphtheria or something, we don't stop them from moving around the, around the country it's it's really up to them it should be people should be educated that there's a there's a risk if they choose not to do it well that's on their head they're they've got to accept the responsibility but saying that we also know that the public's got to pick up the bill if they go to hospital so and anything else but we don't we don't mandate and say say you can't move from melbourne to brisbane if you ha haven't got all your vaccinations, you know, your TB or your tetanus, your, all this sort of stuff. So it seems quite strange for a, a an infectious disease. It is only, uh, well, 80% of the people don't even get affected by it. They won't even contract it. And then there's only a very small portion that will get seriously ill from it. And we, we know that from the original data. And we seem to have lost sight of the original data. Uh, yeah. The original data out of out of Italy when the when it first hit their hard, their, them hard, and that the reason it hit them hard is because Italy signed up to the road, belts and roads with China, and of course China has bought a lot of the fashion industry stuff in Milan, especially the leather good stuff, and because of the belt, belts and roads, which Victoria was going to get saddled with allows China to bring workers in, pay them whatever they, whatever the going riot is in China, take over the jobs in Italy in, in these um, leather goods factory, um, 
but it takes the jobs away. And then what happened is because because of the Christmas period when COVID started sort of, and the Chinese year, these people went back to China. When the Chinese New Year was over, a lot of them came back from Wuhan and landed in back in Milan, and that's where it, where the first big takeoff. But one of the things, interesting things, when it first took off, we were getting a lot of information in regards to COVID morbidity and also the people who were getting sick and passing away in that first month of March last year. All that's dissipated. It's it's now, and it has been seen to be worldwide, just concentrated on, on the numbers of infections and the deaths, um, not who's died or anything like that. Comorbidity. Or even sick. Hmm? Or even <laughs> sick. Like you can... And it's, 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 it seems to me entirely unprecedented that we that you'd base policy merely on positive cases rather than the number of sick or the number of hospitalized or the number of deaths. So it just le it's an idea that lends itself to overreaction and, and disproportionality to me. I think the other thing that happened is too, because we escaped the first wave sort of thing because we international travel blanket came into effect and so we didn't get an intake of, of the of the disease in the first place and it allowed people or state governments to sort of say oh well we haven't had any deaths and sort of and we're, we're going along well and we'll we'll continue to sort of you know concentrate and make sure we don't have any deaths but if you have that philosophy that you're not going to accept deaths in any circumstances well why did why was there no action in 2017 when we had the flu flu epidemic, which killed 1,255 Australians? You know, it was nothing, no, no panic about that. It was just business as usual. And it was a really, really bad, bad flu year. And annually we use, lose between 300 and 400 every year, but we, but we don't, don't throw the kitchen sink out to, to stop one person dying from, from COVID, I mean from flu, and 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 why their reaction now? They're creating this situation where we we don't want to be held uh, uh, responsible for any deaths. So, uh, are we going to see things like the return of the red man in front of the car, the, the man waving the red flag in front of the car? So we don't want any any um, road deaths because it's, it's illogical to try to stop you know. Stop everyone from dying. People will pass away from from these these events, you know, and it's unfortunate. But yeah. they've really backed themselves into a corner with this. Yeah, as as I say, the fatality rate of life is a hundred percent. The I, and I do see it. The this mentality that we eliminating all risk that seems to have taken hold in Australia. We've we've become very risk averse, uh, very safety conscious, health and safety. Uh, it's, it's concerning because that's, it's at the end of the day, it's not really living. I, I mean, you know, you're probably, you know, you, you know, you've got a bit more freedom in Queensland where you are, but I'm telling you in Victoria, in Melbourne, you know, I, I'm sure we're, you know, very safe, but it's not, it's not a life. It's, this isn't living. Um, so it's, it's, it's just, it's very bad. I think I think another thing in regards to the, the original stats and that, um, the media has been no help in regards to their um, seeking accountability from the politicians. I mean, they've done nothing to sort of foster the idea that we, you know, we have rights and freedoms. You know, they've been quite happy to sort of push the push the line. Um, you, you, your freedom should be crushed for the greater good sort of thing. And then when someone stepped out of line or something, they pull eyes on them and saying what bad person they are, you know, and actually encourage people to dob in and, you know, to keep people safe, you need to do this. Has, has the media lost, it, lost its real, um, what its real, real job is? You know, it seems to a lot... It's not just there to promote the government propaganda. It's there, it should be there to question things. But I haven't seen a, a 
a reasonable question from any journalist other than those ones who usually get thrown to the ground, uh, like Rebel News and things like that. But from the mainstream journalists, it's basically just, just tell us what you want to want to say, and then we'll we'll repeat it for you. Exactly right. It, so often you see uh, reporters, journalists, actors, uh, stenographers that they, they they'll merely record what the politicians say and then broad rebroadcast it uh, to the the people there's no scrutiny there's no objectivity almost the, the idea that maybe they're exercising these powers and they need to be held to account in some way uh, but they've for the most part they've been completely missing in action uh, and i do also wonder uh, whether the pandemic has been a bit too good uh, to the media companies to the traditional publishers and the broadcasters you know a lot of eyes have returned to the traditional outlets and maybe and maybe uh maybe running the more fearful narrative uh keeps those eyeballs around so i i, I am skeptical in that sense as well but i think that even so the practice of journalism has been in decline before 2020 i mean I, you know you could say that this is the culmination of something that's been really wrong in that industry and we're just seeing it play out before our eyes but may, maybe it's something that's come about from what what we're fed through the schools into the into different workforces so they, they yeah. aren't really good enough characters to be well, once upon a time journalists. cadet journalists would you know they wouldn't go through the university system they'd be you know, cadets in the newsrooms and they'd be learning their trade from the professionals. Um, and that all changed. It became, uh, you know, the academics got a hold of the, the trade craft um, and, it's, and it's completely compromised. I think, I think two, two things that the media has really failed to do and, and help the general public understand what's uh, about COVID is... The general general failure to question uh, what the disease is and and it, and its impacts and get the, get the health officials to give a fair comparison of COVID versus flu, which is it's closely runs the line with. Um, my understanding with COVID, all right, it, it's a it's a different virus from the flu, which is just a straight the influenza A is just um, H1N1, but we've had some pretty pretty horrible ordinary flus come out too, you know, if going back to the Spanish flu, mm. the Asian flu, uh, I think it was the Hong Kong flu, they all pandemics. And the other thing the media doesn't seem to get a grip of either is, and, and a lot of people don't realise when the last pandemic was, you know, and People just you know, think, oh, ages ago, but the last pandemic was only 2009. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the swine flu. Now, yes. that was only H1, H1N1 influenza A with the variation for the year. Um, and it, it was originally going to be called the Mexican, because what they used to get their names on the where the first death occurs. So, it, first death was in Mexico when they were going to call it the Mexican flu. But for some reason, maybe the relationships between the United States and whatever wasn't, wasn't good. But they did have a link back to Kansas and, and pig farms and things like that. But they called it the swine flu. Now, 2009 pandemic, the only reason that flu was uh, declared a pandemic wasn't because it was, it was death rate or anything like that. It was because the incubation period between getting sick and becoming I think, the first respiratory problems to approaching death was a mere 48 hours, which is very similar to COVID. Whereas in the flu, you usually go five to seven days. So you've got five to seven days with normal flu to intervene, to stop, you know, prevent you from dying. Um, but with that rapid onset, that just 48 hours from being seriously sick to death, was the problem and that's why they gave it a, um declared it a pandemic and australia was very 
very, very fortunate because it started in the northern hemisphere winter season. By the time it got to Australia uh, for our season, we'd already had the flu vaccine. And that year we only actually lost a, uh, 189 people, but the whole, but worldwide, we lost over 500,000 people because the northern hemisphere was hit first and they were, the flu vaccine didn't catch up to them for a while. So that part has never really been accurate, accurately just questioned by the media in regards why, why is this situation business as usual, but this COVID situation, we throw the baby out with the bark water and, you know, it's, it's just... It's a disproportionate approach for, for that. And I think the other thing uh, I think the media is failing to do too is, all right, we've got the vaccine and I think the government should be congratulated in holding the numbers down until we've got the vaccine. But one thing that's never really been questioned enough is how prepared or how much improvement or, or research or looking into has the government done to assist people when they do catch it and the intervention to give them a better chance of pulling through it. Uh, in the first instance, when Trump was around and they came up with ivervectin vectin and, and things like that as possibilities, there was a great big sweep out from them, from you know, both the United States FDA and from, from our, health, our, our health officials pooping it. To me, it's something we definitely should be looking at in regards to looking for therapies to ensure the best chances of survival for the people when they do get it. And, and that's something the media has failed to sort of question and question the health officials or what's being done to better improve the survivability for people who do catch the disease. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the... Uh the discussion around treatment was politicised. I, I definitely got the impression that uh, alternative so-called so-called so alternative treatments were essentially blacklisted or uh, put off the table merely because someone like Donald Trump referred to it. Uh, it, it, it didn't seem uh, the, the perception of the, pe the perception of it was that it wasn't very honest and it wasn't an honest discussion. Uh, and I think that's a fair perception. Mm. But I think, I think the thing that should be is the people who do get sick, they should be afforded every opportunity to survive. Mm. And it's, and the onus is on the health people and, and the governments to make sure every law, therapeutic line is at least looked at seriously to give them the improved chances. But, I think, and I think that's the job of the media to raise those sorts of things. Yeah. We just. Yeah, just I think move, that's right. Yeah. We'll just move back to a couple of things that have, that have occurred in in this um, in, on the political scene. We've had had instances, you know, where Craig Kelly left the um, Liberal Party because he's he's sort of been outspoken on COVID and different treatments and a number of other issues that the the coalition seems to be weakening on. Um, but we also had, well, I think it was last Friday, Barnaby Joyce basically came out in, in, in frustration and basically, you know, carried on that the states need to be abolished. Now, I th that's, that's all well and good for Barnaby to get upset in regards to get frustration with the state governments, what they're doing. But the thing is, these politicians need to remember he could have very easily been Mr. Shorten in Canberra. So while you might sit there and say um, you're, you're on one side of politics and the other and things are not going your way, the state should be, be um, abolished. Don't seem to be forgetting that A, you won't always be in power in, in Canberra. So what, what you're saying is you've got to give other, other guys uh, open slather on the whole nation if you, you happen to fall out of power. 
Yeah, you've touched on it exactly. The the one of the great benefits of federalism, decentralized power is you know, you don't end up with those one party rule type scenarios. Um, and we've seen this play out before, you know, Tony Abbott and Tony Abbott's a, uh, I, th I think he was a, a very good prime minister, but uh, pr prior to him becoming prime minister, he expressed the view that during his time as health minister, uh, it, it would have been much better if uh, health policy was just controlled by the Commonwealth because the states were so bad at it. And I think, uh, and, and they took the same, and the Howard government took the same view with workplace relations reform. Um, and they passed work choices, of course, which when Labor came to power, became the Fair Work Act. And when that's been, uh, and that's raised a lot, of, a lot of problems, especially for small businesses and the like in this country since then. And, and you know, that's the problem. You know, you get the centralization, you get the one size fits all solutions and you get those uh the, the the sort of one party controlling the the entire agenda uh and you know you don't you generally don't get good results from that well i think it's the same situation where like when keating was about i think i think his, his comment in regards to the senate you know it's just they just swill you know um and, and that's just a frustration in regards to Oh, I can't get my way. But the reason you can't get your way is because our founding fathers were smart enough to realise we don't want one lot of people to have it their way. They have to negotiate. They have to, have to compromise. They have to talk. They have to persuade. They have to use their statesman-like skills to get what they want and argue a proper case, not just, oh, well, I'm in charge. It's my way. And I... I really get angry in regards to people saying, oh, well, we should do this or should do that and just ignore what the constitution says, you know, and say, so, mm -hmm. and then Barnaby sort of saying, oh, it's, it's a hundred old, hundred year old piece of paper sort of thing. Well, it's, well, it's 120 year old for the first thing, but the thing is, it's not just a piece of paper, it's a brilliant mm -hmm. document. And if we actually abide by it, we'll do, do well. Um, the troll is, I think, it's been corrupted a little bit. And I think the corruption started in World War II when the states gave up income tax powers for a short time for the benefit of the nation while we were in the conflict of fighting yep. for our lives and our existence sort of thing against you know, a foe in Europe and a foe to the north of us. Now, <laughs> the only problem is the states didn't ask or didn't put a clause on that so it has an end date say mm. five years after after the conflict and i think new south wales did go to the high court in about the 50s to try yep. to get it back and what the high court said and i i i have a lot of problems with the high court because i reckon they make some garbage decisions okay. yep. um and not just on not on not just on constitutional matters <laughs> on things like immigration and that they are really woeful um yep. so they basically said i just well, although there is no um statute of limitations in this country they basically said oh it's been too long and you know you're not getting the back sort of thing well mm -hmm. mistake from the states and then from there we've got a situation where now the commonwealth's got this big bag of money and it just what it can't control by or or can't influence by a decent discussion and sort of a debate with the states and that to get the best outcomes it just weighs well if you do this we'll give you extra money and basically they've taken over a lot of things like health and education uh, mm. that was strictly the states although it, they still belong to the states the states had respect have surrendered a lot of the bits and pieces that go with it um, to to have full control over those aspects or easy funding, and education would have to be the prime prime thing. Now we've we had um, Dr. Uh, uh, Donnelly on a couple of weeks ago talking about the education system and dumbing down and and that uh, that plan and the, and the national curriculum. Yep. Now we've got a situation instead of having several states 
with their own education system and competing against each other and, and fighting to get to a standard of excellence, we've got one, one big organisation dumbing down everything and putting ideology into the curriculum and not science, maths and that. Um, and that's being fed out to the states. And it's really, really a problem. It's the, the way, way that our forefathers envisioned it, the states would actually compete with each other on a lot of these things to get the best outcome they could. And they would be shown up, and other states would be shown up for being poor at what they're doing and have to pull up their, their jock strap sort of thing. So that level of competition, our forefathers wanted that level of competition, whereas the way it is now, it's just dumbing down to the lowest priority or easiest, easiest way to get things done. So, so do you, do you see really out of this, out of the COVID, the states have flexed a little bit of muscle some way in their own. Do you think they should sort of, well, understand their powers and start getting some of these things back that they've relinquished to the federal government? Yeah, I think that'd be, that'd be the best outcome probably from this would, would be uh, an, a reassessment of the role of the states and I would hope to see more accountability for what the states are doing. Um, and this and this might be a long shot, but uh, returning the taxation raising capacity of the states so that they're paying for their decisions rather than simply being dependent on, and in cases demanding the Commonwealth pay for the decisions that they're making. That's a, it's a complete breakdown. Um, I, you know, I, as you know, I'm a federalist. I think the states should be making decisions. I think they should be adopting different uh, policies uh, and testing them against the other states to find uh, what works. Uh, that's, that's how you get to the best outcomes. But that's really only possible uh, where those states are actually you know they're they're paying the costs of the policies as well whereas what we're seeing now is it's it's all it's all kind of managed from common from the commonwealth in in canberra uh and it's and it's a complete mess i don't see i don't see it so much as the individual states getting the income tax back i think it just needs to uh get rid of some of the constraints for the Grants Commission and also the, some of the rules around the GST. I don't believe any state should get less than 90, 95% of its GST. There's, and I think that would probably fix some of it in regards to, especially New South Wales and to a degree Victoria. Victoria doesn't do too bad. New South Wales does carry the can in this. Yeah. The other, and that way, there's a smaller pot of money for the other states. I will get help, but you won't have situations like Tasmania. If you look at Tasmania, it's a mendicant state. Like it, it yeah. only lives, it only survives off the Commonwealth, back of the Commonwealth taxpayer. Uh, if you look at, if you look at its revenue base, seventy percent of its revenue is GST and Grants Commission money. Its internal ability to raise its own taxes, it's very small. And the thing is, it's quite comfortable with that. It's, it knows that it's got to get all this money from the Commonwealth to run things how they like it in Utopia. And we don't, we don't have to cut down trees. We don't have to actually make a living. We don't actually have to have industry because we don't, we don't, we're going to get some money for doing, doing nothing anyway. So we got to a situation where there is no mining left, I think. There's almost no forestry left. And, and that's a really concern. I mean, I don't care what anyone says. People, the tree huggers or whatever. Forests are an asset to the nation. And they're there to be managed for the benefit of the nation and the people. Revenue raising and also just, and for sustain, you've got to be done sustainable. But we've got the situation where a place like Finland, right? 
up there in near the Arctic Circle where wood where trees grow so slow, they actually make more money out of their forest, considering it's not much bigger than Tasmania, makes more money than our whole forestry industry, which is ridiculous. Well, considering the amount of trees and forests we've got, yes, I know there's wildlife and native animals in there, but all those things can be managed. And we we really need to get industries like that off the ground. And then you saw Tasmania turn around and turn down the, and put out uh, put, um, a long-term business out of, out of existence by knocking back a paper mill, which was state of the art. And so basically, shut up shop in regards to industry, job growth, real job growth, other than, you know, other than public service. Because basically in Tasmania, you're either employed by one level of government or you're contracted to one level of government to provide a service, and that makes up 70% of your workforce. I mean, that, that's not much of base left to actually pay taxes and, and provide revenue to actually run a state. So, like I say, they're living on the good grace of the Commonwealth. And South Australia isn't much better. Uh, if it wasn't for the, the old holding factory and the money that the government uh, had in protection and subsidised uh, holdings, and now once they've gone out, I mean, Commonwealth folk pushed all the defence industry into South Australia, so they've got the defence industry holding them up. So it's allowing them to be lazy it, to the extent even South Australia sit there and suck power out of the grid and blow up its own coal-fired power stations and think that it's going to be able to run industry on that on some renewables and some Tesla batteries. So it, it, the way it is with the Commonwealth and the situation at the moment, it's creating these lazy states versus the ones who pay it. So we really need the situation. And I think the only way to resolve it is have more states. And so the Commonwealth has too many states to bribe that can't manage these things. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll go back to the first point about uh, GST. So oh, I completely agree. I, I think the, the Commonwealth Finance Commission is just a, an abomination. Uh, the horizontal fiscal equalisation, they call it, is where they uh, essentially uh, take uh, the GST revenue from some states and give it to you know, Tasmania, South Australia, and Northern Territory, and Northern Territory. Now that, that gets a big slice of that pie. Uh, and of course, at the very least, that should just be, the revenue that gets raised in each state should just go back to the state. Um, and that should be the extent of the, 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 the Commonwealth's role in that. Um, I, I do, I think um, the GST was actually one of the major tools at the, uh, the Commonwealth government's disposal uh, dealing with the states um, under uh, during COVID uh, because the Commonwealth set up JobKeeper essentially to pay the bill for what the states were doing by lock, you know, locking down the economy. Uh, the people that were put out of job, put out of their jobs, they'd be paid by the Commonwealth. If the Commonwealth had just said, every dollar we pay in JobKeeper to each state, we will take from the GST pool. Now, that would have that would have made a huge that would have been a massive incentive on those states to reconsider and recalibrate their policies. In other because words, they'd finally they'd be paying for it. They'd be managing COVID rather than doing what this this, this ridiculous thing of trying to eradicate it. Elimination, yeah. So, and and um, uh, sorry, to your last point, um, exactly more states. I'm, 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 and not just North Queensland. That that's like that's the first state, but I, I think there's. There's definitely scope for more states, um, and I think more smaller states. Uh, that's a that that will lead to a uh, a more a freer and more democratic Australia overall. I'll, I'll just share a screen of um, our vision for for separate states. <laughs> I'll just have to scroll down. Uh, these are some of the things that we should have uh, 
talked about in regards to transfer of powers from the states to the Commonwealth, but here's a, here's a map of Australia and what we've done, what it is, it's uh, a map of all the uh, local government areas. Yep. And what we've just done is we've just put numbers in those local government areas that we think could be a state. We've got one for central and north Queensland. Two, we've got really running down from what is the Darling River catchment right down to mm -hmm. uh, using, say, Portland as their outgoing port as a state. Then over Eden Monaro, uh, across the Alps for, because the Eden Monaro uh, was actually an area that looked to create new, a separate colony. So did the Riverina back in the colonial days and during the, um, uh, even in the 1920s and that. Yep. And then there's the old New England area, yep. which actually got to the situation in 1967. Uh, the then Country Party, uh, at the bequest of the or influence of the New England New State Movement, actually got the Askin government to commit to giving them a referendum if they mm -hmm. won the 65 election. And actually got that referendum. But unfortunately, never, never trust trust your friends because they turn out not to be your friends. When when Askin only had a two-seat majority in Parliament uh, and, in a, and a, a first time in about 24 years they got back into power, um, if there's another north northeast new state had been created, it would have taken about eight or ten uh, country party seats off him and he would have been back into the wilderness. So yeah. he sort of, what they did, they... Um, reinstated the boundaries as indicated by the 1933 Nichols Commission, which was 30 years before. I mean, its relevance was a bit dubious mm. and really should have, what should have happened is should have had another, you know, independent commission, people put submissions and, and the outlines in that. And then when that commission comes up with the question for the referendum and the boundaries. Um, so, I didn't think that was one of the one of the big failings of the New England New State movement. They weren't strong enough in regards to defining that boundary, um, and with Newcastle and right down to Lake Macquarie being in those ballot boxes, that's where they uh, became undone in regards to the to uh, losing that referendum. And the other thing is because they'd expended all their money and the government didn't provide re um, funds for the yes and no case, Labor, which was still, although it was out of government, only been out of government for uh, two years, it still had a massive sway and, and, and still had a fairly good bank account. In those areas of Newcastle's, which were still a still making industry at the time, they just ran a good no campaign. And that's, that's where it was lost. So, uh, it's quite interesting. And when you talk to people today about separate states, they think, oh, it can't happen. It's because everyone's got to vote in it. You know, like a normal people think referendum, like all the states have got to prove it and then the majority. Well, once you explain to people that you know, only the people in the area being hived off as a new state get to vote in the referendum. So you don't have to worry about the people in Sydney if you're New South Wales being a new state. You don't have to worry about the people in the southeast corner of or Queensland, if you're making a North Queensland state, so, so, so that's that's one of the things that, and they go, oh, well, that's a bit easier, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but the biggest hurdle yeah. and probably the most frustrating one is the fact I don't know if our fo our founding fathers were having a go at us or actually thought politicians were going to be similar to them and be statesmen um, rather than what they are today because they put the Investigation of the separate states completely in the hands of the state parliament. So it's can only be initiated through an mm. act coming out of the state parliament. Now, with all due respect to the founding fathers, not foreseeing the two party system, how it came through. Um, and in fairness, if you look at 1920s and 30s, New South Wales government did actively pursue additional states. They had the Cohen Commission and then they had the Nichols Commission. But unfortunately, when it, when that was the Nichols Commission was finalised, it was right in the depths of the um, 
Great Depression. So there wasn't really a big appetite to do too much. And then we went straight into World War Two. So, uh, and then after World War Two, we really have seen the growth of the two party system uh, where neither of them see it's in their interest to see additional states where you have maybe another 12 senators from here and another 12 senators from there and you can't actually control them anymore. Uh, so that's, a, that's one of the things. But one thing I'd like to touch on with you, because I did notice in your biography, uh, the thing that got you interested in the IPA was uh, the debate going on at the time, which would have probably been about 2012, where there was a commission to look into, again, um, recognition of, of local governments in the constitution. Now, last week we had Professor AJ Brown, and he was actually on, on that uh, commission as an expert member. Mm. And his, his position after it was, uh, did a lot of work and they thought it was good, but they also tested the water and felt there was no appetite of the, for the public um, for this, this, this action at this time or the politicians. Um, but it has been something that's been regurgitated a number of times because we can go back to, I think there was a, a referendum in 74, uh, which tried to get, allow the Commonwealth to actually borrow money and pour on behalf of local governments uh, so they could do things. And then there was the one in about 83, we're actually talking about recognition within the constitution to make an actual level, a constitutional level of government. Now, I don't understand the obsession with, with this thing to get it into the constitution. The constitution yeah. is, was formed by the fact that we had colonies gave up their sovereign right to form, and form one nation under the federation. Any one of those colonies could have sat there on its hind legs or a butt and it's just outweighed time until they actually got independence from Britain and became individual sovereign nations. Now they seeded that. They certainly didn't seed it, so they just become broken down to a level or answerable to this level lower level of government or have to sort of negotiate with this lower level of government, which is in the state constitution, the local government's there, but it's only an arm, an administrative arm of the state government. Now, from your interest or your, uh, with the IPA, have you ever looked back into what their submission was to uh, that debate and what their position is now in regards to local governments? Uh, this was before I started at the IPA, of course, but uh, no, I am aware that the IPA opposed the proposal uh, then um, and uh, for the, uh, several reasons, but the, the major reason, is, as I'm aware, is that you know, this would be a, a usurpation of, this, of the, the state, of the states uh, and their right to uh, essentially administer or their role, the responsibility for local governments. Um, you are right. It's a it's a very uh, peculiar obsession of the the Canberra political class. Uh, this idea of um, assuming control of local governments, um, and it's and of course, the regular person on the street would not understand and would have no interest in going along with that. So, um, it, it, no doubt, had it gone to a referendum, it would have swiftly lost again, um, as it would as it had done in the past and will do again in the future well the 80, 83 referendum to have it constitutionally recognized was actually the worst performing referendum ever it only got 33 percent of the national vote and lost in every state so yeah. average punter isn't as dumb as pe as the politicians in canberra want but i do i do believe that the focus on it is to try to undermine the states yeah. by and I think there's there's another thing that Commonwealth should really get out of, and that's and get out of the Constitution, because a lot of things in the Constitution doesn't actually require a referendum, because if you read a lot of a lot of the sections in that, it says until the Parliament otherwise decides. Now, um, 
those things have been there uh, when we had the constitution first formed. Queensland was not going to be part of the Commonwealth. They had, they, we had an ongoing battle in Queensland about cent central and north Queensland colony. They were trying to separate. Now, one of the deals that were done at the secret premier's conference was they made a concession in the constitution where Queensland could divide its territory to have six, uh, elect senators for different areas. In other words, basically, yeah. you can draw a line halfway over it sort of thing and you elect six senators from there and six, well, in those states it was three and three because there was only six senators in each, each new state in the states at that time when it was first constituted. So they were North, Central North Queensland could have elected its three, three senators and, and down in the Southern Division they could have elected their three. Now that provision was always written in there until the Parliament otherwise decides. Now, for some reason, although Queensland got this concession, they never utilised that concession. And when Hawke got in in 83, he decided to decide otherwise and took that provision out. Now, another section that we really, really need to see go is section 95, where it allows the Commonwealth support or give grants to the state. Um, now, that basically said for the first 10 years, basically, so it could, you know, sure, because we had, had situations where West Australia probably only had around about 100, 200,000 people. Tasmania was very, very small. South Australia was, and they were going to need support um, going in, in this, into this endeavour. That, that was the intention, but I think Section 95 has certainly outlived its use and is used improperly by the Commonwealth to buy votes in federal elections. We saw the 2019 election, the sports rorts, where the Commonwealth used provisions to go around and say, well, we'll give you a sports over here or that and that and buy, buy votes in certain electorates. Now, that is, that is not what the Commonwealth is there for. The Commonwealth is not there to get down to that nitty gritty of whether, you, whether your local uh, football club gets a change room or not. It's there to guarantee us the safe, safe keeping of the nation in regards to defence, immigration, biosecurity and other things. So do you, do you think that's something that 95 has, has, should be expired? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, just uh, Section 95 alone has caused a great deal of damage uh, to the, the, the federal character of Australia. Um, and the, the common uh, Canberra really is able to bully, essentially, control the activities of the states um, through the tight grants mechanism. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd, I couldn't see um, any case for preserving any of it at this point. I think, um, and, and th this goes to a broader point that, you know, the founding fathers were, were very wise and they devised a very good constitution, but there, there are parts that, while they may have been initially necessary, um, through either an accident of drafting or through misinterpretation, um, are now problems. Uh, and and they're, they're causing more problems and they, um they need i think you know if we're going to have referendums if we're going to ha have proposals for change well let's actually think about the changes that would improve governance improve uh the democratic and federal character of australia saying that they actually didn't they, section 95 can be written out by the by the government by the parliament any time it doesn't require a referendum it just because it says until the um, otherwise decides. So our founding fathers were wise enough to say, well, here's a provision, expecting people to be the same calibre as them, yeah. say, well, when it served its purpose and the, and, the and the new states are standing on their feet, you can take that away. And it'd be interesting to actually go through the whole constitution again and see what sections are actually uh, can be taken out by the parliament and what 
what I don't think there'd be much left that would really need uh, of the things that have to be changed by referendum. I don't think there would be much there. I think the, you'll find that most, like I say, it'd be an interesting exercise to go through the constitution and see what what the problem causes are, are causes are or sections, and see if they are actually easily written out by Parliament, because section 95 can be it can just go and and, and if you read a lot of the sections that they can be altered by an act of parliament they don't need the consent of the people so it's, it's i think we've got to give our founding fathers a lot more credit than, than a lot of politicians give them and the other thing i suppose we've got to forgive our founding fathers for the fact they probably didn't perceive the caliber of people who would go would go in and become politicians that they would be so petty and and political and party orientated rather than nation orientated because if you look look at the conventions and that there was those people taking coming from west australia um, queensland and that coming together completely managing their own affairs and then happening to make concessions to for and make a nation so was a was a great exercise so we have to give them we have to give them some leeway in regards to oh they just probably couldn't see foresee the short mm. the dropping caliber of the people who actually come after them yeah one of the great tragedies of australian history is surely that um the 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 political class you know at, at the time of federation uh they just they did they did not know and could not know the mediocrity of the political classes that followed them um so and i agree i i, I think that the what they devised would by an honest and nation-oriented political class would be uh, completely functional uh and beneficial for the for the country but um as you say uh, the, the the leaders that we've had in australia just that they, they they don't measure up um, um, I should refer uh, your listeners also to uh, an article I had in the IPA review some years ago, uh, and it actually uh, it touches on what what you were mentioning, uh, and it, it listed ten of uh, ten of the um, uh, I can't remember what the word was, but it was something along the lines of the ten. Uh, biggest mistakes of the Australian Constitution, and it and it identified all those provisions that you're speaking of, which um, use phrases like "until the Parliament otherwise provides," in which the Parliament ultimately uh, did not eventually <laughs> hold up their end of the end of the bargain. <laughs> well, that, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the, the caliber of people who came out um, be politicians are much different from the people like John Sir John Forrest. Alfred Deacon, Griffiths, you know, completely different colour. But I mean, when you've got politicians, I mean, they left university, they joined the on the local members' office as some staffer and then went yeah. on to be, become a politician. Like, no life experience. I mean, we've got a ridiculous situation here in, in uh, Queensland. We've got a first term uh, minister, first time elected, 26 year old female, not that the female is a problem. But 26 years old, never had a real job in her life. He's the Minister of the Environment. Right? Now, what world skills have you got to be, you know, yeah. uh, caliber to look after that job as a minister? And then just to cap it off, to, to make sure she does the right thing, you go and get a Chief of Staff who happens to be a former um, uh, chairman of the Wildlife Fund or something or the Conservation Australian Conservation Society and put him there as the um, chief, you know, the chief of staff. What what chances do you think the farmers and people in agriculture and industry have got when, when you've got that sort of stumping up that sort of calibre of politician and and a bureaucrat like that? that and I think, I think one thing that's coming out of COVID is I think a lot of people are getting fairly testy with the public service in regards to it's just out there by itself and it's just enjoying itself, working from home, getting full paid and on money well above what most people are doing the same job 
And I, th I think people are starting to grind their teeth over that. And I, I would hope somewhere along the line, we actually have a chance to pull the public service back into line and get it back onto a footing where A, it's more productive and B, it's more in line with uh, what the people, the wages of the people are actually paying paying their, their way sort of thing. So I think that's gonna be a very interesting concept. Is there any points you'd like to, we've just gone over the hour and 10 minutes. Um, is there anything you'd like to want wrap up on too? But in regards to that paper, if you send us the link, we'll put it up on our Facebook pages and, and on our website uh, so it can, uh, people can reference it. And the show will be uh, recorded and put up to Facebook. Um, in, Great. In a few uh, no, I, the only thing I'll say is uh, uh, thank you uh, for having me. I, I enjoyed the chat. Um, and uh, all the best. The only, only thing we want to chase you about is trying to get the IPA to chase up the idea of, hey, more states, good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I, I think Indeed. I think that will actually bring back the fabric of the nation though, because when, when we first, when we were first founded as a nation and even up to the fifties, you know, a good percentage of the population lived in the regions, even more people than lived in the inner cities, you know, in the 50s and even up the 60s, there was no Gold Coast, there was no Sunshine Coast, there was none of these great population centres, so you still still had a lot of input from the regions. Now, now as we go on, that's dissipating, and the only way to get that fabric back is to have three, more, yeah. you know, three or four new states, all in the region, with, with their um, numbers, their right number of senators and that, to get some sort of bounce back in regards to the wealth, of, where the wealth is coming from and respect to the people out in the regions. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I, uh, I reckon you might be interested in a research paper I'm uh, currently working on, which is almost ready for release, uh, which I've, um, done an assessment of uh, comparing the the parliamentarians in 1901 compared to today and uh, just the massive shift away from uh, rural uh, agriculture and working class based people uh, who were represented in parliament uh, and these are MPs who had that background who actually worked in you know as a working class farmer uh, labourer kind of background and it's complete it's almost entirely evaporated it, it's uh, almost just non-existent nowadays so i think one of the one of the worst situations i mean one situation you could really look at is the new south wales um parliament in regards to they've got eight eight and a half million people and now only eight seats or in the legislative assembly are actually western divide mm. Now that is really, really scary. Mm. And at the moment, Central North Queensland, we've got about 17 seats in the 93 seat parliament. Yeah. But if we grow to eight and a half million people and things stay the status quo, we could look at a situation where the whole of Central and North Queensland only has between ten, eight and 10 seats yeah. in the parliament. Yet if you look at what the wealth that comes out of the Central and North Queensland, it dwarfs the rest of the state as far as you know that lovely thing yeah. that comes in foreign exchange right you know, it, yeah. it needs to change yeah. anyway do so much of the wealth generating activity uh, occurs in those regional areas but they have next to no representation in their parliaments uh, it needs to change well we'll wind it up there i'd like to thank you very much for um joining us tonight um, if you just stay on the line, I'll just wind up the show and have a quick chat with you and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed tonight's show, please like, share and subscribe to our Facebook page. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Next week, we'll be having... Uh, the group on that's looking after or trying to show the Cran Range Bypass Road here in Cairns uh, to link the port of Cairns to the to 
to the Atherton Tableland and beyond to the Cape. So join me again next week. Thank you.